Hallelujah. Thank you, ladies. Amazing job this morning. Let's give him one more hand clap. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you once again for the power of your spirit. We thank you for your anointing that is in this house today. We thank you for the power of God that flows in the body of Christ through the Holy Ghost. God, you're empowering, you're equipping, you're lifting up. God, you're raising us up. God, we're going to be a light in a dark world. God, we thank you for the truth that is in this house today, that Jesus saves, that Jesus heals, that Jesus delivers, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We thank you today for, for your presence. We thank you because of who you are. And God, today, through the power of your word, let your will be done. Let your will be manifest in our presence. God, as you accomplish everything you desire to accomplish through the Word of God today, in Jesus' precious name, and everybody said amen. Amen. Praise God. The Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endureth to all generations. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord this morning. I believe God's given me a great word for the house today. I don't know. I, the, the problem may be the deliverer of the message, but uh, you bear with me today. Amen. I believe God's going to touch somebody through the Word as well. What a what a powerful and blessed time today. We want to remember the folks, uh, the, the people in Kentucky today. Uh, I know that uh, you have heard the news reports, and uh, there's a lot of news that hasn't yet come out about everything that has happened there. Uh, just a little over about two years ago, we went through that. We know what that's about. Um, the only difference is that uh, God was so merciful to this area that we uh, we did not have many people potentially could have been killed in those tornadoes. But God was watching over us. But um, we want to pray for those families today. There are families that, of course, have lost loved ones. There are families that their homes have been destroyed. Uh, it's a devastating time. You remember how it was here, how it was in, in these communities right here, but in, in this community around us and uh, in our community. Our, our hearts uh, were, were touched. Uh, our, our minds and our lives just took an immediate 90-degree right-hand turn. We changed our focus. It was, about, it was about surviving. It was about reaching out, helping people, caring for people in their time of need. So I'm going to ask you to join me in a word of prayer for these people uh, in Kentucky, Arkansas, Tennessee, those places that were, were hit hard by the storms. And I want you to just ask God to meet the needs. You know, a, a, a lot of times in times like this, it's difficult to really kind of pinpoint how you, how you need to word your prayer because there's so much, so much need. The devastation is so great. And you say, well, Pastor, how, how do we pray? Do we pray for this, that? Well, I tell you, just pray that God will meet and supply because he's Jehovah Jireh, the God who sees and supplies our needs. I pray... I want to pray today that God would supply every need that's needed, whether it's financial, whether it's a medical, what, whatever the needs are, that God will supply the needs of families right now, uh, the needs of homes uh, and, and finances. And God will just, it will just come in. You know, what a, what a great influx of, of love and compassion that came into these, our communities two years ago from places all around the world help flooded everywhere within two days i had an 18 wheeler full of water sitting out here in the parking lot and we were unloading it and and hundreds of thousands of pounds of of food and supplies came in in those days and you remember that we all were involved in that and god helped us to help others and i'm i'm praying and i want you to pray with me right now that god will just meet those needs that uh we know god's got resources beyond beyond what is even imaginable uh, for these communities. So pray with me, and that His love, power, and grace will just sustain the, the broken hearts of hurting people today. Father, as we uh, come to this time in the service, Lord, our, our hearts go to the wonderful people of Kentucky. God, those people that are broken today, those people who have lost loved ones, and these dreadful storms, God, people who are, are grieving the loss, people who have lost homes, lost businesses, lost thousands and thousands of dollars worth of, of, of property and, and, and other things. But God, those things can be replaced. But God, those lives that have been lost, we pray for those families. We pray for comfort. We pray, God, that you'll supply every need in their life. 
God, that the, the need and the, the help will just flood in to the, those communities. And God, that those people will be undergirded, that they will know that they are loved and cared for. And I praise you and thank you for it in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. And I don't, I don't know exactly what we're going to do, but I just feel into my heart, uh, I, 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 I feel like we, we want to give a financial blessing to those. I don't know yet where we are. I know some of our, uh, I know one of our churches was pretty hard hit in Kentucky there. I don't know what the damages are to other churches and, and that, but we're going we're gonna to give something in behalf and I know you support that amen how many of you support us giving a, a financial gift amen God's blessed our church and we can do it and I want you to pray about it and if you want to be a part of it just uh, add something to your offering today as you leave and just say for for tornado assistance or just write tornado or just capital T if you can't spell tornado amen but we'll make sure that we we do a part of reaching out to these communities I wish I wish we just had millions of dollars that we could just pour into that but God knows amen it's it's not about us giving it all it's about us just doing our part amen amen I love you today you're a great church amen. thank you Nick I was waiting on that and I just didn't come back you know I, I'm just Today I want to continue in our, our sermon series. I, I believe God's given me a, a powerful word today. I, I hope you're ready. I hope you're ready for something that the Word of God is, is, is so revealing. In this time of the season, last week in, in our first sermon in the headlines of Christmas, of course we talked about, I talked to you about the revelation uh, that was given to, to the, the king, uh, Ahaz, uh, and how that God uh, revealed the truth of this coming king, uh, the one who was going to sit upon the throne of his father David. That was the promise uh, that Jesus would, would be born in Bethlehem of Judea because that was the, the place of King David. And how that all transpired, that when the time was right, God uh, laid it upon the heart of a man by the name of Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing, of course, was... Uh, throughout the, the, the land and everyone, the Bible says, went to be taxed. Uh, in Luke chapter 2, it's recorded that Mary and Joseph uh, went to be taxed. Of course, they were espoused or engaged. And the Bible says that uh, they went uh, out of Nazareth, out of Galilee, unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, for they were the house and the lineage of David to be taxed. And the the all of the things that were leading up to this very pivotal moment in history, one of the greatest moments, if not the greatest moment, in the history of this world was when the Savior came to earth, that advent. Uh, we, we talked about that revelation. We talked about that particular headline. But this morning, uh, if we, uh, in, in this context of understanding the Christmas story, uh, we would pick up the the Bethlehem Beacon, as I called it last week. Uh, this uh, We might read something that went along these lines. Go with me in your mind. Take this journey with me today. Let the Holy Spirit touch you. Here's what today's headline might read. Shepherds experience angelic visitation on Bethlehem hillsides. It's a sign to mankind and a revelation of God. It is reported today that a group of Bethlehem shepherds experienced a miraculous visitation from a multitude of angelic beings in the sky surrounding the hillsides overlooking the city in the night. Witnesses say that as the shepherds watched over their flocks during the night that they were startled and deathly afraid as they were approached by a large angelic figure whose brightness illuminated the night sky and was blinding to all who saw it. He spoke to them that a Savior, Christ the Lord, he called him, was born on this day in the city of King David and that the sign that this was indeed true was that they would find in the city a baby that was born in a stable and 
that they would find him swaddled, laying in a manger for his bed. Then the shepherds testified that a massive angelic choir, too massive to even number, appeared before them in resplendent glory and sang worship to the Most High God, El El Yon, and added the following declaration, Peace on earth and goodwill to men. As quickly as they appeared to share their news, they disappeared. Immediately, scores of shepherds swarmed the many stables located in the city, creating quite the stir among the townsfolk and the livestock as well, looking for this sign that the angel had spoken unto them. After a diligent search, a group of shepherds found the stable and the child just like they had been told by the angels. After a short visit at the stable and with the child's mother and father, they returned to the Bethlehem hillsides and their sheepfolds to tend their sheep, sharing the blessed news with everyone they met along the way. Their words, the Lord, our Messiah, has come. There's more to come on this amazing story as reports from local shepherds continue to come in hourly of their witness to this heavenly phenomenon on the hillsides of our city. Just think about the headline. Think about, the, think about this moment in time when this small city, Bethlehem, is all of a sudden illuminated at night by a host of angels and the glory of God shining upon them, shining round about them. And the Bible says in the King James Version that the shepherds were sore afraid. It literally means they were terrified. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. This shall be a sign unto you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And after the angels went away from them, the shepherds said one to another, Let us go now even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has been made known unto us. And they came with haste. And what do you know? They found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Amen. Praise God. They found it just like it was said. Just like they were told by the angels in that angelic choir. Today in this the context, the Bible says, and when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. Verse 18, And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and that they had seen as it was told unto them. Today I want to talk to you about this sign to the shepherds that it was truly a revelation of the Messiah, the Son of God, the good news to all humanity. On the ceiling, over 100 feet high of the dome of a palace in the city of Rome, Italy, is a painted beautiful picture painted by the famous Italian artist Guido Reni in the 15th century. To stand at the door level and look upward, the painting seems to be surrounded by a fog, which leaves the painting unclear. But in the center of the great dome room is a huge mirror, which, is, which in its reflection picks up the picture and by looking in the mirror in the center of the room, you can see the picture with great clarity. And the point today is this, is that Jesus, Jesus and the, the revelation to the shepherds, the revelation to humanity, the revelation to common man, he did not appear, they did not appear to the kings and make it known unto the kings or in kings' palaces, but they came to Bethlehem hillsides and they revealed this to the, to the common man. As a matter of fact, shepherds were considered the lower or the lowest caste of people in that society. But God appeared unto them, a man of the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and it was revealed to them this 
Messiah and Savior that was to come. Jesus is the earthly mirror of our heavenly God. We read in the book of Hebrews chapter 1, it says, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory, listen, and the express image of his person, the earthly mirror of a heavenly God, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he hath by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance attained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. This glorious experience, and the sign of the shepherds was a great revelation of God the Son to the world. And so today I want to share with you very quickly three truths. Three truths about God's revelation of himself in Jesus Christ. Number one, Jesus came to identify with us. Jesus came to identify with you, with me. John chapter 1, verse 14. You know the scripture. John writes, And the Word was made flesh, and we and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus came to identify with us. First, in sharing our humanity. Jesus shared our humanity. In Hebrews 2, 14, the Hebrew writer says, For as much as we are chil- as the children of the are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Or in other words, Jesus took upon himself human flesh. And then it says that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. I want to tell you, Christmas means so much more to me, amen, than just some trimming on a tree or some lights in a tree or on a house. Christmas means so much more, amen, to us, church, than that it means so much more to this world than all the materialism that is surrounding it but listen Jesus shared your humanity in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 he says for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 Paul writes He says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made of himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus shared our humanity to identify with us. Secondly, Jesus validated our humanity by being born in human flesh, dying, and being resurrected. Galatians 5, 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that you would. But if ye be led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Amen. Jesus validated our humanity when he came into this world, surrendered himself to die on a cross, was buried, placed in a tomb, and on the third day, resurrected from the dead. He validated our humanity. And he who, the Bible says he took upon himself in his own flesh the sins of the world, having nailed all of those things that were against you and against I because of the law, and the breaking of the law. The Bible says for all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. Amen. We're, we were all born sinners. We all had this handwriting of ordinances of the law against us. Amen. The case was good. Amen. We were guilty of sin. But the Bible says Jesus took it. Amen. And he allowed it to be nailed to the cross in his flesh. That's how he came to identify with you and I. To validate us as human beings. Thirdly, 
to validate us as human beings, to share our humanity. In that identity, Jesus fulfills our humanity. Romans 8, 29, For whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. You understand that God's determination from the determinate counsel of eternity past, amen, was, amen, that, that he would redeem this world and that he would send his Son and that the Holy Spirit would work in the world, amen, when his Son would then go back to be at his right hand, that he would send his Holy Spirit and that Holy Spirit would work every single day of every single life of every believer in this world to conform them to the image of Jesus Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit's doing in you today. That's what he's doing in me. That's what he's doing in all of us today. He's trying to conform us. He's trying to work on us, to mold us into the image of his Son, Jesus Christ. First, Jesus came to identify with us. Secondly, Jesus came to reveal God to us. First of all, Jesus did not come that God might understand us. Did you, did you know that God, the Bible says that, that He knows us? How many of you know that He knows you? Hey, amen. He knows, the Bible says He knows us. He knows our down sittings and our uprisings. Uh, he knows the very thoughts and the intents of our heart. He knows uh, the very hairs, the number of the hairs on our head, the Bible says. He, he's that in touch with who we are. God knows everything about us. As a matter of fact, you can't hide anything from God because the Bible says in Timothy that all things are naked and open under the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. Everything God sees, everything God knows. We can't fool Him. But the, the truth of that is this, that Jesus came to reveal God to us and that, and that Jesus did not come that God might understand us. He's God and he understands all things. But here's, here's the powerful truth. Jesus came that we might understand God. Wow. Not that he might understand us. Some people say, well, did Jesus come in flesh so, so that God could understand what it meant to live in flesh? No, he understood it. He understood it all. He understands all things. He knows all things. He's omniscient, right? So God knew that. He knew what to expect. Jesus knew what to expect when he come in human flesh. He knew to, what he was going to suffer. He knew that. None, none of that was foreign to Christ when he came into this world. None of it was foreign to him when he began to grow up as a, a child in Nazareth, as he began to mature, and as the Holy Spirit began to work in his life. He knew, he knew that. He knew what he was about to face. But here's the point. God in flesh, Jesus came that we might understand God. He was God with us. The angel said to Mary, you remember the words? He said, Mary, you're going to have a child and you're going to call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. I want to tell you that God is with us. Through the eternal spirit of Christ, God came to be with us so that we, could understand God. The Bible says in the scripture, of course, in uh, the scripture it says, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So when we, we get that picture, Jesus being the, the mirror, Jesus being the mirror of God in, on earth, the heavenly God on earth, when we look at Jesus, we see the Father. As a matter of fact, Jesus said that. Get that picture, that spiritual picture in your mind. Jesus is the mirror. God, a, a reflection of God the Father on earth. And Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the what? Father. He that has seen me has seen the Father. I and the Father are one. And so today the, you understand the revelation that the, the shepherds received was a powerful revelation that Jesus was the Son of God, the Messiah. That was the good news. 
and revealing God that God would come into this world so that men could identify and understand Him. Secondly, the revelation of God is described by three words here by John. John 14, verse, or excuse me, John 1 and 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now look at those three words. The three words used there, number one, is glory. The glory. The Hebrew word is, ka, is kabod, meaning the manifest presence of God. We beheld His manifest presence. This is God present with us. And we beheld it. We saw it. With our own eyes, they said. We beheld His It carries the meaning of the splendor of God. The fullness of all His divine attributes. Moses stood on Mount Sinai and prayed, Lord, show me your glory. In Exodus 33, that prayer was answered in Bethlehem's manger. In Bethlehem's manger, God showed us His glory. He showed it to the shepherds. It was manifest on earth. In the Old Testament tabernacle, the glory of God appeared as a bright cloud called the Shekinah glory of God. And the meaning is that which dwells or inhabits you know the Bible says he inhabits the praises of his people hence the presence of God is with us the kabod the glory of God the presence of God the manifest presence of God is with us and it says at times it flooded the beyond the holy place in the tabernacle so all the people saw the splendor of the glory of God when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration the Bible says His glory was revealed through His flesh in John 1, 18. No one has ever seen God. Every person who wants to know what God is like, in Jesus we see God face to face. In Jesus we see God face to face. Think about the mirror in the middle of the room. Think about the reflection that Jesus is of the Father. And if you want to see the Father, if you want to see the if you want to understand the love of the Father, the compassion of the Father, the care of the Father, the commitment of the Father to you and I, amen. All you have to do today is look at the gift of Christmas called Christ. Jesus came to reveal God to us. Jesus came to identify with, with us. The second word he uses is the word grace. Grace is mentioned three times here. If I were to ask today, what makes Christianity different from other religions and philosophies, what would your answer be? What, what makes this different from every other philosophy or other religions of the world? The differences lie, I believe, in one word, grace. In religion, man speaks for God, speaks to God through prayers, good works, and religious observances. But in Christianity, God is revealed as the one who seeks for us. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now think about that. When you think about Buddhism, you think about Hinduism, you think about all these other religions of the world, all of it is about them seeking God their God are you, are you tracking with me here but Christianity is totally different because it says in John 3 16 hallelujah for God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved and he did it he, he, he did it before the foundation of the world before anyone ever believed in it Amen. That's the difference. The difference is grace, God's grace. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I want to tell you, Christianity is a faith of grace. Amen. It's a faith of grace that says there's a loving God who's seeking after me. The Bible says he came to seek and to save that which was lost he's seeking for you he was seeking for me when he found me amen and he saved my soul you remember the day when he as he was seeking for you that he found you 
That's the difference in this, this thing called Christianity and all other religions. They are still seeking for their God. Our God has already come. Amen. He's already come in Jesus Christ. And he's seeking for you. And he's seeking for me. Hallelujah. Christian's Christmas story is the story of God seeking for us. The Christmas story. Seek God seeking to save us from our sins and to reconcile us back to him. And in verse 16, John says, For the, from the fullness of His grace we have received one blessing after another. Grace upon grace and wave upon wave, every person has been touched by the grace of God and lives by the grace of God every moment of our lives. Fresh grace is ours. It's new every morning. We don't have to live on yesterday's manna or spiritual experience. Do you understand? That's a, that's a type of grace. God gave manna. Israel didn't deserve it, but he gave it to them. Amen. Every morning, fresh and new, right? And he, didn't have, he told them not to, to store it up for the next day. If they tried it, it would, worms would, would come in it. It wouldn't last till the next day. The only day was on the Sabbath day, and they would, they would gather enough for the Sabbath day and it would last that one day, and then it would last no further. What a miracle of God. But it's a picture of grace. It's a picture of God's grace that is new, and it's fresh every single morning, and it comes not because we deserve it, but because, Sister Sarah, God is good. We sang about it this morning. Amen? That's why you get God's grace. Not because you're good. Not because I'm good. Not because we deserve it, but because He's good. That's why we have His grace. That was, that was John's expression here of, of, the, of Jesus Christ and the revelation in human flesh. We beheld His glory full of grace. And then thirdly, and truth. Those three words to describe the revelation of God in Christ to this world that the shepherds sought after that that evening after that they got that wonderful announcement from the angelic visitation in the heavens of Bethlehem. The third word is truth. Truth is the ultimate objective. Faithful, reliable, dependable, changeless. It's truth. Jesus in John, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. He is the unique Son of God. Men and angels are called sons of God, but only Jesus is divine. The unique Son who alone can reveal the Father. He has no equal. Amen? I say Jesus has no equal. John also refers to Jesus as God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side or the only begotten Son of God. When reclining at the tables for dinner in the ancient East, a person might easily lean over and rest upon another, a picture of the closeness between the Father and the Son. But the idea is Jesus said, I and the Father are one. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. What a revelation. Bring, brings me to that Last point. So God was revealed to the shepherds in the sun, born in a manger, wrapped or swaddled. The Bible says the revelation and lets us know that the revelation was because God came to identify with us so that we could understand God, that we could touch God. Isn't that amazing? Secondly, that God would be revealed and then lastly that Jesus came to give himself for our sins. What a gift. What a great gift. Luke 22, the gospel writer Luke says, and he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and gave unto them saying, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper saying this cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you the bread and the what the bread and the wine 
Now, now let me let me show you something here. The words of the Old Testament prophet prophesying where Jesus, this Messiah, the Son of God, would be born. He said he's going to be born in a place called Bethlehem Ephrata. Bethlehem, Beth, is a prefix meaning house or house of or dwelling. Now watch this. Jesus, Jesus, before any of this, before any of us understand the, the concept really of, of what's going to happen on the cross, he's not on the cross yet. But and, and he's doing this in preparing the disciples for what he's about to do. He's going to be crucified, he's going to bear our sins in his body he's going to shed his blood to wash those sins away now we we understand what's getting ready to happen but Jesus with the disciples he takes the bread and the wine the fruit of the vine and he takes that and he says this is my body that was broken for you and this is my blood that was shed Bethlehem means house of bread Ephrata means fruit of the vine. Now that was, that was prophesied hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus was born. It was prophesied hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus stands in an upper room and has the Last Supper, the Passover meal with the disciples just prior to his crucifixion. And yet the prophet said, Bethlehem Ephrata, you're though you be little among the nations, among the thousands of, of cities in Judah, yet out of you is going to come a ruler, a governor. Out of you is going to come the Messiah. Bethlehem Ephrata, house of bread, fruit of the vine. Isn't that interesting? You see, God knows all of that. God doesn't do anything haphazardly. Everything has meaning. Everything, everything has substance and meaning with God. Jesus came to give himself for our sins. It was the picture. That was why Bethlehem. Bethlehem, house of bread. Body. Fruit of the vine, his blood. Bethlehem was a picture of the intent of God to take his son and put him on a cross. Get the picture? House of bread, fruit of the vine. First Peter chapter 2, verse 24, Peter writes, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. For we were as sheep gone astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of our souls. First John 4, 12, listen, no man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us his spirit. And I want to, again, Jesus Christ, the revelation to the shepherds was to reveal Jesus Christ as the Son of God, that he might identify with us, that he might be clearly revealed to us, that we might get the the true picture of who the Father is through the Son and that He would die for the sins of the world. But let me, let me close the message today with what I believe is even the most powerful part of the story because the, today's message was about the headlines. Shepherds in Bethlehem hillsides experience an amazing phenomenon. They see angels in the sky. And the angels sing and glorify God. That, that's the headline. That's the news. But in spite of all that has been written, why shepherds? Why to the shepherds? Why would they get the sign delivered to them, an unusual sign? Why a baby... In other words, a sign. I mean, they could have, God could have given them anything as a sign. Remember, he in last month, last week's message, Ahaz, God told Ahaz, he said, "Listen, you 
I'll give you a sign. Ask for me a sign that I'm going to deliver Israel. Ask for me a sign. He said, man, make it. It, it, it can be as deep as hell or as high as heaven. It doesn't matter. Another, you, you can just encompass it in, the, in, in hell or heaven. Whatever it is, just a sign. You want to see a, a bird fly backwards through the sky? You want to see a fish swim backwards in the ocean? You, you want to see heaven to hell, you name it. I'll, I'll give you a sign. Ahaz said, mm, don't want to. God says, okay, I'm going to give you one anyway. And he gave him, he gave him the sign of, of the birth of the Christ child. But why did God give this unusual sign and say, the sign is going to be a baby. Everybody say a baby. Swaddled in a manger. It's a shepherd. Why a shepherd? Okay. Stay with me because we'll be going to prayer in just a moment. But listen, listen to what I want to share with you. This is possibly the most powerful part of the whole story. If, if the revelation of the Son of God is not powerful, this this. This will help you. How many of you remember the scripture that says Jesus is the Lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the world? You remember hearing that? Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. I'm going I'm to answer the question. Why Bethlehem? Why shepherds? Why swaddling clothes in a manger? If you've ever wanted to know, before you leave, if you stay, you'll know. And it's powerful. It's really powerful. Listen, in spite of all that has been written about the little town of Bethlehem that lies just outside the West Bank, a postcard, Bethlehem, has birth princes. And as a boy, David tended sheep in the very northwest hills where today shepherds still tend their flocks of sheep and goats. But what is much less widely known and what connects us with this, tra this Arabic translation of Bethlehem as the house of bread or house of meat is this. The kind of sheep cared for, now listen carefully, the kind of sheep cared for by Bethlehem shepherds were a special kind that made a special kind of of sheep that made the name Bethlehem synonymous with the fields that were full of lambs ripe for slaughter. Now, now remember, Bethlehem is just within two miles of Jerusalem. There are no, there are no there's not grazing area around Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a large city. Some of you've been there. You know what I'm talking about. There's not grazing. All of the sacrificial lambs for temple worship were raised in and around Bethlehem, the majority of them. Stay with me. Bethlehem carried another brand identity alongside house of bread. It was the house of meat. In the midst of the, in the it really, it was, it was basically a butcher shop, so to speak. Bethlehem shepherds were not just any shepherds tending sheep. They were descendants of David, tending David's flock. Sheep that were destined for the temple. Jerusalem was only a short two miles from those Bethlehem slopes. They literally were outsourced employees of the temple or the royal as royal shepherds. If truth be told, the center of religious life in Jerusalem was the massive slaughter of animals. According to the Torah, every day two lambs were required for sacrifice in the temple. So get the picture. Every single day, 365 days a year, two lambs required for temple sacrifice. Okay? That's 730 lambs every single year. Twice daily offering of a male lamb was known as the tamid, the continu known as the tamid or the continuous offering. 
The Lord had told Israel, he said, the fire is to never go out on the altar. Right? The fire is to never burn out. You're to keep the fire of God going on the altar, and it's to never burn out. This, to me, this continuous offering. Stay with me. I'm almost, I'll be there in a moment. You don't want to miss this. It was the first offering and the last offering of each and every day. First offering, last offering of every day, two lambs every day, 365 days a year. On the top of that, thousands of lambs were needed by Jewish families at Passover and other religious rituals. One of the most widely observed of the Jewish holidays, Passover, required a lamb to be sacrificed for every household that could afford it. All the lambs were ritually killed at the same time and in the same place. But before they were slaughtered, each lamb was required to be a pet in the family for at least four days. Hang on. So the day after the final Sabbath, before Passover, shepherds from Bethlehem, the Bethlehem hillsides, drove thousands of lambs into Jerusalem where they were taken in by Jewish families for at least two days and treated as members of the family before they were sacrificed as the Passover lamb. And the Jewish priests would ask them, do you love this lamb? If the family didn't love the lamb, there would be no sacrifice. When Jesus asked Peter three times, now listen, Jesus was talking to Peter that day. And he asked Peter, and he asked him three times, Peter, do you love me? Are you, are you tracking with me? The, Jesus is talking to Peter. This is before his resurrection. This is when he's, he's teaching the disciples. He's ministering to them. He's training them and mentoring them. He's only with them for three short years. But one day Jesus looks at Peter just before. He, just before he leaves earth and he says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. He says it again. Peter, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, I love you. And he said, feed my sheep. He asked him the third time, Peter, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know I love you. You know all things. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Why? Because I am the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. And if you love me, Peter, then there will be a sacrifice. He affirmed his identity as the sacrificial Lamb of God. When we love Jesus, we receive the gift of his sacrifice, redemption from death of a resurrected life. We celebrate the day after the final Sabbath before Passover by a different name. We call it Palm Sunday. There were two possessions on that first Palm Sunday. One was an unwilling possession of thousands of perfect lambs herded into the city by Bethlehem shepherds. The other was a willing procession of the one perfect lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Bethlehem's shepherds had to learn and follow special techniques and rituals during the lambing season. I'm tying it all together. Stay with me. Give me five more minutes. Bethlehem's shepherds had to learn and follow special techniques and rituals during the lambing season. Why shepherds? Why Bethlehem? Why swaddling clothes? Why lying in a manger? These shepherds, these temple shepherds, royal shepherds during the lambing season Bethlehem lambs were born for slaughter were very special lambs you see the, the Lord had told Israel he said if you offer a lamb it has to be without what? blemish it has to be without spot it can have no blemish it can have no, nothing wrong with it so therefore the, these shepherds to prevent harm and self injury from 
thrashing about after the birth of a spindly-legged lamb. You ready? These newborn lambs were swaddled in strips of cloth and laid in mangers to keep them from hurting themselves and creating blemishes in their flesh. Then they were placed in that manger, the feeding trough, where they could calm down out of harm's way. After careful inspection by the shepherd, any spot or blemish, no matter how slight, meant instant rejection or slaughter. The Hebrew word is translated for lambs without spot or blemish. It means lambs that are complete, whole, entire, and sound. The shepherd's who gathered around Bethlehem. Gathered around Bethlehem's stable where the, where the Lamb of God was born were not witnessing anything new except who was in the manger. The most important sacrificial lamb who had ever been born. The lamb who would close down the slaughterhouse of sacrifice, the perfect Lamb of God who would die once and for all, for all the sins of the world. Everything about Jesus' birth, everything that was revealed to the shepherds, the reason they were sent there because they knew what a lamb in a manger meant. They knew what something swaddled, a lamb swaddled in a manger meant. They, they related that to the sacrifice. They related it to the temple and worshiped to God. And the Bible says the angel said unto them, You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. That's the sign. The sign is it's the Lamb of God. The, the sign is who is going to be slain from the foundation of the world. What they knew, what they realized, whether you, whether you can grasp it in your mind right at this moment or not, what those shepherds realized when they looked in that manger, they saw that baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. Amen. Amen. They realized that meant sacrifice. This shall be a sign unto you. Good news. Good news. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord and this is the sign you're going to see him he's going to be wrapped he's going to be ready for sacrifice the next day when John saw Jesus coming down into the Jordan River to be baptized he said behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world even the ox and the ass straight from Isaiah chapter 1 verse 3 testified to the fact that the promised one would come out of Israel's promises and prayers. As in Balaam's story, the star of David came to lead the wise of the world to the place where Israel's king came and was born. Jesus is the three shepherds. Of the three shepherds, he's the good shepherd, the great shepherd the chief shepherd. And he presented himself as both sheep and shepherd. The good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. It's completely different. Sacrifice in the temple. The sheep now have a good shepherd who feeds them and does not slaughter them. The sheep now have a good shepherd who is one of them and understands them as one of them. We all like sheep have gone astray. Isaiah 53. We all like sheep have gone astray, but the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Like lambs to the slaughter. We were, we were on our way. You were destined as a lamb to the slaughter. But amen, Jesus Christ came into this world so that you and I, if you were here last week, when I talked about Barabbas so that you and I could go free. Instead of being 
lambs led to the slaughter because of sin. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. When Jesus proclaimed Himself the door of the sheep and the good shepherd, the good shepherd and the sheep became one. Jesus died on the cross at the ninth hour about three o'clock in the afternoon when the Passover lamb would be sacrificed in the temple. Christ, the Paschal, Passover lamb, was slain to atone for the sins of humanity to open the gate of the true temple that promises God's salvation to all people. The house of meat. The temple of rituals, of sacrifice and slaughter was transformed into the house of bread. Jesus, the one who was born in Bethlehem in old Hebrew, the house, Beth, Bethlehem, house of bread, declared that the sacrifice of meat would no longer be the gateway to God's salvation and God's presence. Bread would become his body, his flesh. Meat and God's presence would now be found around the tables as much as at the temple. Now listen. Shutting down the slaughterhouse, Jesus moves us from the temple to the table. Shutting down the slaughterhouse of death because of sin. Like lambs to the slaughter. What we were destined for because of sin, the slaughterhouse, the temple, to face your sins and my sins because of the law of God that said all of sin that comes short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death and every one of us were destined for it. But Jesus, but Jesus, Shut down the slaughterhouse. But the Bible says there will be no more sacrifice for sin. Hallelujah. He shut down the slaughterhouse and moved us from the temple to the table. Jesus has a table spread where the saints of God are fed and he invites his chosen people to come and dine. There's so much power, so much truth to this Revelation to the shepherd. That's why shepherd. Wasn't because that it was just happenstance or by chance. Those shepherds held a, a very relevant place in temple worship. They knew exactly. They knew exactly what it meant to find a sign in a manger of something that was swaddled. And they realized that that was the Messiah, the Son of God. That revelation is to us. And the revelation is, instead of facing the temple, we now can come to the table. Would you stand with me all over the house today as we prepare for prayer? There's a song that invites us to come to the table. Jesus has a table spread today, church. The Christmas story represents anything to us. It represents that you and I can come to the table. Rather than being like the sheep that had gone astray in Isaiah 53, the Bible said He had laid upon Him the sins of us all. And I can just, in, in a spiritual picture as a lamb that was destined to die because of sin you and I and that day the day that as I was walking the journey of my life as you walk the journey of your life if you're saved today the day that he on your destiny that was leading you to face your sins at the temple and to die because of those sins, all of a sudden you were diverted. 
all of a sudden Jesus stepped in your path. And he gives us an opportunity. He said, he said, all you that come to me, I will in no wise cast out. And you and I have the opportunity today to come. Now I want you to, I want everybody to bow your heads with me, if you will, please. Just bow your head. And I as we prepare some music back there, if you will, but I want you to bow your heads with me. And I want you to, I want you to hear. I want to pray if there's anyone here today, you say, Pastor Renfro. I've never accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Last week, last week we had a soul come to the altar and to be saved. And my prayer is today if you're here, as heads are bowed, no one looking around, but if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you've not accepted Him and, and, and you still feel the load, the guilt, and the weight of your sin in your life, then you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you need to come to Christ and receive forgiveness today. While heads are bowed, I'm going to give an opportunity. While they're playing the music, if they will, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray. Or to, and I'm going to do it this way. If you're here and you say, Pastor Renfro, no one look around, please just bow your heads and just pray. Ask God to help you today receive this revelation of the Word. Lord, help us to receive the revelation of the Word. But if you're here today, say, Pastor Renfro, I want you to pray for me. I need Jesus as my...